So we are very lucky to be joined by none other than Shami Chakrabarti, thorn in the side of the war on terror, the first Baroness ever oh. on the Navarra media set. We've had to settle for Dr. Bastani all this time. <laughs> so this is an upgrade title wise. I don't think it is because doctors tend to earn their, <laughs> earn their <laughs> titles. But thank you, Ash. Lovely um, to be here. Thank you so much for coming on. And of course, you are also shadow attorney general. And this is where I want to kick off because one of the things I've never seen you get asked about is what the role of Attorney General would be like for a socialist government. Because one of the roles of Attorney General is you have to advise the government on the legality of their policy proposals, of their legislation and their use of crown powers. And so you had, you know, poor old Mr. Cox getting in a bit of hot water over his legal advice to the government over prorogation. And there might be some squeaky moments for a socialist government. John McDonnell says that if he's nationalising rail, mail and water, it might not be at market rates, which would bring him into conflict with international treaties and the like. What would your advice to him be? I'm absolutely clear. And by the way, um, this is as both Jeremy and John McDonnell want it to be, that we will comply with the domestic and international rule of law. Now, you're quite right that um, Article 1 of Protocol 1, A1P1 as we call it in the trade, of the European Convention on Human Rights does protect people's property rights, but it's not an absolute right. So you can interfere with, um, with, with people's property, but you have to act in a way that is, um, that is not arbitrary, that is proportionate, that's justified in the public interest. Um, and, and, and there are ways to, to, yes, redistribute wealth and power, but to do it um, in a way that, 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 that doesn't conflict with the law. But let's talk about the partial nationalisation of BT to deliver free fibre optic broadband for everyone in the country. You've got the estimate from Labour being put at 20 billion. You've got the estimates from BT being put at 80 to 100 billion. And there will be a process of negotiation and conflict. There will be debate. There will be d debate. And of course, Parliament is sovereign. And that's, and that's really important. This isn't just going to be... Um, you know, John McDonnell or Shami Chakrabarti, you know, deciding, um, you know, deciding what appropriate compensation is. There has to be a, a proper process, but, but we, can, we can achieve all of that. But as I say, property rights are not absolute. Um, and um, the European Convention on Human Rights, which we are all completely committed to, and one of the best things that, um, that the Labour government did in the late 90s was to incorporate that convention via the Human Rights Act, um, does not create an absolute right to property because that would mean the status quo forever. And of course, that's not, uh, that's not the intention. So we will, we will, yes, be a radical transformative socialist government, but we will also act responsibly and preserve the rule of law. Well, let's talk about this new story which came out, I think, last week about the CPS setting targets for successful convictions of rape cases. What's wrong with that? Because to my untrained eye, setting targets for successful convictions for a crime like rape, and those conviction rates have historically been very low, that seems like a good thing. Well, in principle, of course, um, it's a good thing for any organisation to be to, to be motivated to do its job well. But but the danger is of is of targets that create a perverse incentive to only take on easy cases. Right. So, so here's how it goes. Rape is one of the most serious crimes. We we know this. You know, after 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 murder, an attempted murder. Um, you know, rape is right up there amongst the most serious offences. But it's also one of the hardest to prove. Now, generally speaking, um, when you're deciding whether to bring a prosecution, you, you want to know that it's more likely than not that you will succeed. There's no point investing resources and, and, and frankly, upsetting complainants and, and, and everyone else by, by charging offences where there's a less than 50% likelihood of, of succeeding. But if you start saying that your target is that you're going to have 60% success rates, by definition, because rape is more difficult than other crimes to prove, you are, you are almost decriminalising rape in a whole raft of cases. And that's what seems to have happened. And worse still, this was a secret policy. Um, and, for, uh, and we believe now that it was operating for two years between 2016 and 2018. It was being denied that such a target existed. And it was, you know, grassroots 
women's organisations, victim support groups that suspected that such a policy was in practice. And then finally, um, investigative journalists working with those campaigners out of the policy just, just a few days ago. So if you get rid of those targets for successful convictions of rape, how do you propose pushing up that conviction rate? So, so what I'm saying is it should be when you're deciding whether to bring um, a charge, it should be because you think you've got a, a 50% plus uh, likelihood of succeeding and that you think that it's in the public interest to bring this um, this prosecution. And I think it is certainly in the public interest to bring rape prosecutions because of the seriousness of this crime. And, and the, the other thing that we need to do is we need to change the culture around sex offences and rape. We need to better support victims. We need to, to offer them proper counselling and support throughout the process. That hasn't been happening. We need to not treat them like suspects by taking their mobile phones en masse in the police station. We need to invest in, um, in better trained police officers and prosecutors. There's so many things like that that we need to do. I really do think that austerity is a feminist issue in general, but it's a particularly acute problem in the criminal justice system. Do you think that Me Too achieved that kind of culture change in terms of changing perceptions of what sexual assault looks like, who it happens to and who perpetrates it? I think Me Too um, has um, perhaps started a process, but it's the beginning. It's nowhere near the end. Um, goodness me, you know, just, what was it, a few weeks ago, maybe, maybe a little more, maybe it was sort of late September, um, Charlotte Edwards wrote in the Sunday Times um, about an experience she said she, um, she had with Boris Johnson, where he basically put his hand under the table up her skirt. And that was a big story, her comment piece in the Sunday Times for a day, but where is the follow-up? Her testimony, if proven, would amount to a sexual assault by the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. Where, you know, where's the follow-up? You know, where, you know, for me too to make the real difference that it must going forward, we need to be more tenacious about, about these things. We need to call these things out again and again and again. Now, understandably, people are very interested in, um, in Ms. Arcuri mm -hmm. and, um, and she's out there, you know, she's, she's out there, um, uh, you know, on the TV, she's going to be ghosted no more. And people find that very interesting and amusing. And there are, you know, financial questions uh, that Boris Johnson needs to answer about that relationship. But I am particularly concerned about this alleged sexual assault and why it hasn't been followed up. But don't you think that the problem is, is that Charlotte Edwards' account of, I agree, that would be a sexual assault, is that it was treated like gossip. And the same with Jennifer Arcuri, is that the key issue about use of public funds and a uh, conflict of interest not being declared by Boris Johnson when he was mayor of London, that's been superseded by a kind of salacious interest in gory details. You know, she gets put on GMB because, you know, the hosts are hoping that she's going to say, yeah, we had an affair, we did it X, Y, Z many times. You're quite right. We're, we're seeing a trivialisation of things that are really quite serious um, issues of conduct, character and even the criminal law. And that's a and that's a that, that's a serious problem. And, and until we um, start being a bit more clear-eyed about this, then then Me Too will be the beginning, but nowhere near, um, nowhere near where it's got to be. I mean, look. Speaking of trivialisation, you're a brown comrade. I'm a brown comrade. Let's just put it on that level. And your work with Liberty in particular made you a real thorn in the side of those who wanted to see more surveillance, uh, more infringement of civil, civil liberties, all in the name of national security. That's right. The Sun newspaper once called me the most dangerous woman in Britain, Ash. Really? Yeah, that was, oh my God, that that was, that was a high point. Than the Baroness. We've that was a high point. Well, no, no, no. I, I have to admit, I mean, I dined out on that for some time. You can, <laughs> you can imagine. You go around the country speaking to people about civil liberties and you're saying, be afraid, be very afraid. I mean, the Sun newspaper once called me the most dangerous woman in Britain and it's really interesting because you can tell a lot about a part of the country or a particular audience by their reaction. You go to some parts of the home counties and people are a little nervous. You go to other places and they give you a standing ovation before you've even begun, Liverpool being an obvious place. <laughs> then the Daily Mail spoilt it for me because they, they took my title away and they gave it to Nicola Sturgeon. I mean that doesn't seem fair. You should 
You should sue. I should sue. You should definitely <laughs> sue. But look, most dangerous woman in Britain. And we're slap bang in the middle of a culture war where in particular... Jeremy's personal polling on national security issues is very, very low. And now you're out there in a general election making the case for a Labour government. Do you ever sometimes wonder if women like me and you are not the best people to make the case to certain parts of the country because of that culture war? What do I think that I should sort of sort of be quiet because I might offend certain yeah, people? Yeah, the home that... counties. No, I, th- I, th- I think that... Um, the culture war, as you put it, is 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 good old fashioned divide and rule, mm-hmm. and it's you know it's it's a it's a, it's a right wing trick, it's a far right trick. Trump oh. does it, Johnson does it, um, but but I I have to believe, and I do believe that in the end, people are slightly better than that, and that if you speak to your values, the chances are there are a lot of people who share those values, even people who are different to us, who look different to us. You know, our humanity is, is really what's going on. There's one race and it's the human race. Now, of course, it's easy for me to say that and sometimes it's harder to, to cut through. But, but I've, um, in my life, I have experienced more fairness, more kindness than I have of the bad stuff. I mean, I think one of the things that I've learned through this campaign is that places are very rarely as they have been described by a Westminster dominated media. Yeah. So it simplifies everything. I've got expectations yeah. of what a Lee voting area will be like, and that is simply not how it feels when exactly. I'm there. Exactly, you know, and if you show people um, a little respect, quite often they'll, they'll reciprocate, not always, but quite often they'll reciprocate. This point about Westminster pundits, okay, I mean, too many political journalists in particular, forgive me, treat politics as if it's sort of, um, as if it's sport or drama. They're more like drama critics or, or sporting correspondents. Who's up, who's down, who landed a blow? You know, it's a, it, it's a boxing match, not a political debate. And then there are these patronizing um, suggestions, for example, that, oh, no one's gonna come out and vote in December. Well, people go Christmas shopping in December. <laughs> people go to work in December particularly working people who get up at four in the morning to go in and clean offices and, and factories. They do that in December. I believe people will come out this December for it, uh, what will be the most important general election of my lifetime. You're, you're a fair bit younger than me, Ash, so you might have another big one in you. But for me, this is the most important general election of my lifetime. No, no, no. I mean, this better be the only big one. I want socialism now, a green industrial revolution, cheap housing. Then I'm just going to clear off and have some babies. I mean, I'm out. I'm checking out. No, you're not. But I want to I press this idea about the culture war and yeah. in particular how you become a signifier of something else. So one of the things that the BBC loves to do is that they keep trying to get me to debate Douglas Murray. And the reason why they do that is because I'm young, because I'm brown and because I'm left wing. So the minute you've got that visual, it's already fulfilled his central thesis of what the main conflict is in society. So as someone who is also female, brown, left wing. I've debated Douglas Murray and, you know, this, um, there are people who want to there are people who want cartoon cutouts and there are people who allow themselves to become cartoon cutouts or, you know, pantomime villains and whatever. And, you know, you can make a whole career out of it. And, um, and you and I are not pantomime characters and we don't need to go out looking for, for other pantomime characters. I think um, what you're doing here um, uh, is having a discussion. Right? You and I have so much in common, but we don't necessarily agree about everything. But, but you know, the business of politics should be about putting our values out there and then and then developing policy and, and having a real discussion about ideas rather than just punch and judy. Well, one of the things that the Conservative Party hasn't really grappled with is this wellspring of support they found from the far right in recent months. Because even though Boris Johnson claims to be you know, the socially liberal mayor of London, a one nation conservative. There are all these Tommy Robinson fans who are yeah. out in full throat okay. supporting let's him. Be, let's be clear about this. You know, in his career, um, Boris Johnson has played both sides. You know, he's, he's, you know, tried to be a chameleon. And, when, you know, when he was, you know, getting elected in London and suddenly he was sort of pro-immigration and liberal and civil libertarian. And I remember that. Boris Johnson from um, from my time at Liberty, 
Um, and, and then in the Brexit campaign, he's dancing to a different tune. And now, you know, he's, he's gone to the far right. And I'm really sorry to say that. I am someone who has conservative friends. I've, had, I've worked with conservatives um, in Parliament on civil liberties issues. So I'm not somebody who says I can never do business with conservatives. But Boris Johnson is now not even playing to a traditionally conservative playbook. He is playing to a Trump, Bannon, far-right playbook. And these aren't even dog whistles. These aren't even dog whistles. When just regular, regular whistles. They're just, you know, they're foghorns, <laughs> right? They're not dog whistles. And I think you saw it with the shutdown of Parliament, with this whole Parliament versus the people mm -hmm. vibe, um, which I'm glad to say our Supreme Court um, dealt with 11-0 pretty robustly. <laughs> So I don't think I don't think it's a socialist government that has to worry about the rule of law. I think it's um, these people on the far right, and I'm really sorry to say it, but Boris Johnson is now amongst them. But are you caught some harassment yourself outside the court by far right demonstrators? What do you think happens to those people after this general election, if Jeremy Corbyn wins? Do you think that that organised far right contingent is going to go away, or will they transform into something else? No, they'll always be. You know, there's always been an organised far-right contingent. You know, I, I grew up in the 70s and the 80s. I remember the National Front. Uh, so let's not pretend that there hasn't always been an organised far-right contingent. But what we can do with a democratic socialist government is take away people's pain and people's, you know, legitimate grievances that have been ignored for too long. And then the far-right contingent will be there, but it will dwindle. And they won't be able to play on people's pain and they will not be able to divide and rule in this country anymore. So in the spirit of last night's leadership debate, I thought I would do a quick fire round for you. Ash, okay. Are you up for it? All right. This could be the make or break of your career. It'll be the break, I'm sure, but never uh, mind. All right, let's do some nice easy ones. What would you get Boris Johnson for Christmas? Would I get um, a new job? <laughs> I was going to say an at-home paternity test, but new job, even better. Uh, Keir Hardy or Keir Starmer? Hardy. Would you prosecute Prince Andrew? Um, I would need to, to look at the evidence. Oh, very good answer. Well, you know, what do you expect? Very slick answer. Um, sweet or savoury? Savoury? Ooh, yeah, you're, you're like me. Abolish your private schools, yes or no? No. No. Ooh, how come? Um, I, I, I think that there are human rights implications if you, actually, if you actually say to parents you cannot privately educate your child. And there are also issues in relation to, to children with certain special needs and, and so on. But I think we need to tax them because mm -hmm. these are businesses that are making huge profits and they need to be taxed. And I think that we need to regulate them far more than they're currently regulated. And I think we need to invest so much in the state system that you would have to be absolutely silly to think of wasting your money on a private school. And last one, I promise. Tell me about the first general election you ever voted in. First general election I ever voted in? I'm so old, Ash, that's so unfair. Can so was I it even remember? <laughs> yeah, something, something like that. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you about the first election that I really remember being mm. engaged in. And that was 1979 when I was 10 mm. years old. And I remember Thatcher being elected. And I remember um, how concerned my parents were. I remember the concept of the milk snatcher. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember the implications that followed um, for communities and, and for our schools. I, I, I was yeah, becoming political at that time. For me, my first memory of a general election was 97. Oh, sweetheart. Because my mum took me into the voting booth and let me do the X. And then very cleverly, she took us to the Turkish shop and got like a big, beautiful watermelon. So I always associated Labour with this delicious watermelon, this sort of like Pavlovian response. That's a really good, that's a really good memory. And, and also the watermelon will be cut up into slightly more equal portions than at the moment. But also green and red, Green New Deal, innit? Green New Deal. And, and the, do you know, I, I spoke to someone the other day who said, please, please, Shami, can we have a Labour government? I've had enough of this trickle up economics. Mm. I mean, I hope it will be 1945, 1997, 2019. Inshallah. Inshallah. Thanks for joining us. Cheers. Cheers. Us.